Our topic today is materials and sustainability, and we'll talk in depth about the rare earths. But the idea here is to give you an, a flavor for how materials impact the whole issue of sustainability. So let's move on to the first slide and see where we go. First question really is, what do we mean by the word sustainability? It's thrown around a lot. People talk about it all the time. But people are very imprecise in what they mean by it. So in my definition, it is simply the ability to endure. And what that requires is the ability to exist without consuming or despoiling all of the resources that you need to exist. So that means um, not using up everything that you rely upon to live. The resources that we typically consider necessary can include things like food, water, air, sometimes land, certainly in the case of this lecture, materials, but also energy, shelter, money. Uh, if you run out of money, you pretty quickly cease to exist in many cases. Um, people are a resource that are required for sustainability too. And I'm sure you can think of others all by yourself. So moving along, what are sustainable technologies as, just, as opposed to just simply sustainability? Well, they conform to the definition of sustainability. They're technologies that don't exhaust the resources that they depend upon. So they don't damage the environment. They are price competitive, meaning that they can work economically and uh, are not likely to be displaced from the marketplace by something that is cheaper. Um, they have secure supply chains for everything they need. If they need materials, the materials are available and reliably available. If they need energy, they have a reliable energy source, etc. Ideally, at the end of their useful life, they are completely recyclable. And very importantly, they should generate wealth for everybody who is involved with them or helps to produce them. If they don't generate wealth, they will not last very long in a free society. So what are the roles that materials play? They're very broad and very complicated, but let me talk about a few that are very current today. Materials with special properties are important because they enable several of today's sustainable technologies. They often have supply chains which can be challenged in the short term or the long term and threaten the sustainability of the technologies that depend upon them. And I'll give you a few examples in the next few minutes. Materials processing, that's the, the, the methods by which materials are extracted from the earth, converted into useful form, and then made into components of um, things that we use like cars or cell phones or iPods or wind turbines, all of those processes produce waste and the discarded materials can pollute the environment or they represent wasted resources, wasted energy. So um, minimizing that wastage in the processing of materials is part of the role of considering sustainability in the processing. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the rare earths. Um, and the rare earths is an interesting group of materials. They're the ones highlighted in the periodic chart here. Um, they are 17 of the elements, including all of the lanthanides. That's the first of the two rows that hang off at the bottom of the periodic table. And typically, people also include scandium and yttrium, which are not truly rare earths, they're certainly not lanthanides, but they're usually considered to be part of the group. The rare earths are not all that rare in the earth's crust. They're about as abundant as, for example, iron, but they are not um, found very widely in high enough concentrations to make them easily extractable. So iron is relatively easy to find in extractable quantities. The rare earths, not so much. So it's rare to find them all in one place, but if you dig up a handful of soil in your backyard and do a careful analysis, you'll find very small quantities of rare earths in that handful of soil. The challenges about them 
are that they are chemically very, very similar. They have the same electronegativity or very small differences in electronegativity, very small differences in ionic sizes, and that makes them very hard to separate from each other. They're very useful to us because they have certain special properties. They're almost magical in some ways. Um, it's often because of the fact that they have partially filled F electron shells uh, in terms of their chemical makeup. And it's that partially filled 4F electron shell that gives them some very special properties. We'll talk about that very soon. They represent for us a very intriguing interplay between environmental issues, because there are certainly environmental issues with extracting them and producing them. The economics are very complicated, as I shall show you. Um, but they enable certain um, of the technologies that we all regard as being sustainable. So things like wind turbines, for example, depend heavily upon rare earths. Hybrid electric cars depend extremely heavily upon some of the rare earths. Um, but there are also even political sustainability issues associated with the rare earths, as we shall see. Some of the applications include the things listed on this slide, which comes from Molycorp. Molycorp is one of the leading producers of rare earths in the United States. Molycorp mines rare earths in an open pit mine in California in a place called Mountain Pass. It's on the road from Las Vegas to um, uh, Los Angeles, uh, just over the border between Nevada and California in the desert. Not a friendly place. Um, you can see here some of the things that they're used for, though. They particularly find uses in magnets, which show up in motors and generators. They're used in phosphors, which show up in lasers, in the displays on your television, your computer monitor, your iPhone, your iPod, whatever other um, uh, displays you have. They show up in capacitor sensors, colorant scintillators. They're used in refining of petroleum products. They're used in certain electronics. Even the lens on your cell phone's camera is made using a high dispersion lanthanum based glass, which is, and lanthanum is one of the rare earths. So, very widely used, and they have very special properties that make them invaluable in all of these applications. Here's a little bit more uh, organized list of where they're used. So, you can see uh, photovoltaic films in solar cells. Um, can be used using uh, actually indium gallium tellurium. None of those are rare earths. They're all considered sensitive materials or um, critical materials sometimes. Um, moving along, magnets are made typically these days the best magnets, the strongest and lightest magnets used today are typically made out of neodymium, iron, and boron. They may contain praseodymium. Uh, they will probably contain dysprosium, but all of those are rare earth elements. Um, those show up in uh, generators and in magnets. In your car, you will also find um, uh, rare earth materials such as cerium in the catalytic converter. If you have a hybrid vehicle, there'll be lanthanum in the battery. Uh, if in terms of lighting, the classroom you are in is probably lit with uh, fluorescent lamps, and those fluorescent lamps have phosphors that include europium and terbium that give them the color that is attractive to the, to the eye these days. Without those, you have these old-fashioned, ugly, um, greenish lights that nobody likes to be seen in. Uh, they don't make anybody look pretty. In your automobile, here's a little bit more of a cutaway diagram showing you some of the applications of rare earth. Not always do you find the rare earth actually in the car. In some cases, the rare earths are used in making the car or making the things that go into the car. So for example, when you polish glass or you polish silicon to make it into microelectronic circuits, ceria, that is cerium oxide, is the preferred 
uh, abrasives for making uh, for polishing those components. It has very special properties as an abrasive because not only does it actually cut through material, it is slightly chemically reactive to silica or silicon, which makes it a very superior polishing medium. Um, it's also used in um, diesel fuel additives. It's used in generating um, petroleum fuel. It's one of the components of the catalysts that go into the petroleum. So these materials are very widespread. They're used in very small quantities, but without them, your car becomes much less efficient and much heavier um, and much less environmentally sustainable. In terms of clean energy applications, wind turbines sometimes use large permanent magnet generators. And in, in some cases, the preferred magnet would be a neodymium iron boron magnet. With a magnet made of neodymium iron boron, you have a sufficiently strong magnetic field that the coils of the generator do not have to turn all that fast to make sufficient voltages um, that are suitable for use in the electric grid. That's called a direct drive generator. You can just connect the, um, the rotating components of the generator directly to the wind turbine blades without a gearbox. You have a very efficient and very low maintenance generator. If you don't have neodymium ion boron, you have a weaker magnet, you have to turn the coils of the wire much faster. When they have to turn faster, you need a gearbox. And whenever you drive past a, um, a wind farm, you see a wind turbine that isn't turning while all the others are. That's one where the gearbox has burned out. So um, the gearboxes are definitely a weak link. You want to avoid them. You can avoid them if you can use neodymium ion boron. High efficient light bulbs, the compact fluorescence and long tube um, fluorescence, as I said before, you require europium and terbium, also yttrium, to generate the phosphors that produce the warm light color that we all desire. The rare earths, as I said before, a little bit um, almost magical in their behavior. Neodymium ion boron magnets actually contain relatively little neodymium. It's not the neodymium that makes them magnetic. They're really iron magnets. What the neodymium does is it lines up the magnetic moment or the, the spin of each of the iron elements, of the iron atoms rather, keeps them aligned so that you get the full strength available from all of the iron atoms in the magnet. Without the neodymium, the iron uh, magnetic moments tend to wander around a little bit, partly cancel each other out, and you don't realize the full strength of the iron in the magnet. In terms of phosphors, the um, green color that is necessary to make a good phosphor comes from terbium. The red comes from europium. And the blue comes from other elements such as gallium. But with the red, green, and blue, as you can see in the diagram on the right, the chromaticity diagram, if you can hit those corners, the red, green, and blue, then you can produce a sufficient mixture of light to get any color within that triangle, including the nice clean white that we like and the slightly warmer um, white lights that are so popular in the hardware stores. Um, but without the green from terbium, and the red from europium, you tend to have a greenish blue light only. And so those colors are very important. Also, those colors are required if you want a full color spectrum in your television, uh, in your um, smartphone, or your iPod. So those are very important elements for us. Rare earth element production started while well, rare earth elements have been produced for a long time at very low quantities because they weren't very useful. Starting in about 1965, the Mountain Pass mine first opened. And interestingly, it produced um, mixed rare earth elements primarily for lighter flints. So they have this unique capability that when you strike uh, an abrasive against them, they produce sparks, and that's required for a lighter. It was in 1965, if you watch television shows like Ad Men, 
you know, that everybody smoked all the time. Um, nowadays, in the US at least, very few people smoke and there's not so much demand for lighter flints, but all of these other uses of the rare earths have developed. Starting in the 1970s and 1980s, China started producing rare earths and could produce rare earths less expensively than the, um, the mountain pass mine, which is the, represented by the pale blue sector in this graph. And eventually, in about 2002, the mountain pass mine eventually couldn't be sustained on an economic basis. It was considered not economically sustainable because Chinese produced rare earths could be sold for less money than it cost to produce rare earths in mountain pass. And there are various reasons for that, among which is that mountain pass ran into some interesting and very difficult environmental problems um, that would have cost a great deal of money to fix. So another aspect of sustainability, the mountain pass mine was not environmentally sustainable within the limits set by its economic sustainability. So all these different aspects of sustainability kind of uh, interact with each other and roll up to the whole issue. So in 2008, after the mountain pass mine stopped producing, China produced the vast majority of the world's supply of rare earths. Roughly 97% of all rare earths came from China, and that means that all of the magnets that were used in the world, so from 2008 until almost today, if you bought um, an iPod and you used earbuds, then those earbuds had magnets in them with material that originated in China. And China started to uh, raise the price of rare earths, and that caused something of a crisis that um, became known as the rare earth crisis, starting in about um, 2010, 2011. You can see here the prices of rare earths, FOB China, that means free on board China, as means if you bought rare earths um, and you wanted them delivered to the United States, you would pay for them and they would become your property when they're placed on board a ship in China and the price you pay reflects the price to, to deliver them to the ship in China. The shipping after that, that's your responsibility. But what you see is the prices of a few of the rare earths, in this case neodymium, praseodymium, and samarium. And you can see the startling increase in prices. Um, some of these materials increased in price by a factor of more than 10 as the Chinese exports started to increase in price. This is partly due to the fact that China was actually um, developing itself. The Chinese population was growing more wealthy. They wanted um, more of the kind of consumer goods that the middle class in America is used to. So Chinese, the Chinese population wanted to have electrical power delivered to their homes. When they had electrical power, they wanted televisions, they wanted cars. All of these things require rare earths. And China was starting to need all of the rare earths that it was producing for its own population and its own needs, its own economic um, growth. So what happened then is that in response to the high prices, it suddenly becomes economically viable to start looking at opening up some of the old mines. And the first one to reopen was actually the mine at Mountain Pass in California. Molly Corp went back to the old mine. It actually, um, Molly Corp changed hands a few times. It was bought by uh, a group of people it then became a publicly traded company. Um, but the management of the Molycorp mine set about reinventing the way that they process the material mined there to make it much more environmentally sustainable, uh, to make it use much less water in uh, its processing, which is a key element of environmental sustainability and to make it much, much more energy efficient too. So the result is that um, 
As I speak today at the end of calendar year 2012, the Mollycorp mine at Mountain Pass is coming up close to its full production capacity, and it will generate a significant amount of the world's needs for rare earths in the next few years. We should talk about the term critical materials because that has come up over the last few years. When a material is essential for a particular technology, particularly when it's essential for a clean energy technology, such as wind turbines or hybrid vehicles, but when it's subject to a supply risk like the rare earths, then it's called a critical material. If you don't have access to a critical material, then you can't build the, um, the most efficient and low maintenance wind turbines. You are challenged in building your hybrid cars. Um, you can no longer make tiny earbuds for your iPod and you have to walk around with big over the ear earphones, which I noticed coming back into fashion anyway. So maybe that's not such a big problem. But interestingly, even the loudspeakers in your car have neodymium ion boron magnets in them. And if you take away the neodymium ion boron magnets, you have to have a bigger and much heavier loudspeaker. And in order to fit that in your car, the car door has to be thicker. And making the car door thicker makes the whole frame of the car um, deeper. And eventually, um, just making that one small change could make the car about 300 pounds heavier and therefore much less efficient. So these truly are critical materials. If you take away your access to the rare earths, there's a sort of cascade of other effects that happen that make us less energy efficient and therefore, in, at least in terms of driving, much more heavily polluting. So materials research is actively engaged at this time working to do three things. One is to increase the diversity of supply of materials like the rare earths by making mines outside of China economically competitive. We're trying to find ways to mine that is less expensive and more environmentally sustainable so that we have the rare earths to make other products more energetically sustainable. We're also at the same time trying to stop this from needing to mine for rare earths. So it's kind of an interesting two-pronged strategy. While we're trying, on one hand, to make more rare earths available, we're trying to um, make less rare earths needed by inventing replacement materials. So we're trying very hard to come up with replacements for the neodymium ion boron magnet. So you'll be able to have tiny, tiny earbuds uh, to distract you from boring lectures like this, no doubt, um, and not have to have neodymium to make them. At the same time, when we make things like uh, neodymium ion boron magnets, particularly tiny ones, we tend to cut those out of larger chunks of material. Whenever you cut anything out from a larger chunk, you generate waste, little um, bits of uh, ground up material from the cutting process end up on the factory floor and uh, those get swept up and basically get thrown away because we're not very good at recycling those. So we're trying to make uh, magnets and other um, components that are made out of rare earth in, a, in ways that are much more efficient and have uh, much less waste produced in the processing. We're also working to take the waste that is produced and recycle it. And that's a very challenging project all by itself. Recycling from waste is actually harder than extracting materials from the ore that you dig up from the ground in a mine. So there's lots and lots of work for material scientists to do to make sure that we continue to have access to these critical materials. This is a, a quick graph that shows you some of the complications of the rare earths. The rare earths are all mined together. So when you go to a, um, a rare earth mine, if you visit the mountain pass mine, which is represented um, by the, the green bars on this chart, it produces lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, samarium, and all the others, the heavier rare earths. Um, you can see that the 
mine produces more cerium than anything, um, quite a lot of lanthanum, and a fair amount of, of neodymium. These all have to be separated from each other. The, it, separation is a very, very complicated process, involves a great deal of advanced chemical analysis, and advanced chemical, in, actually chemical invention. We have to invent new chemi chemicals that can separate materials that are chemically almost indistinguishable, like neodymium and samarium, um, very, very hard to separate from each other. This graph shows you the actual value of the ore, which is not the same as the amount that's produced. You can see that neodymium, because it's much more valuable than cerium, generates much more revenue for the miners than uh, cerium does. So that means that um, if you want to have an economically sustainable mine, you want to be able to separate neodymium, but you also want to be able to get some of the other high-value products like the europium, which is that taller bar just a little bit to the right, and terbium and dysprosium, which although they're produced in very, very small quantities, are very, very valuable. One of the things you have to do if you're operating a mine is find value for all of the material you haul out of the ground. So um, finding uses for lanthanum and cerium, which are currently underused relative to the amount that is produced, that's a very important project too. So inventing new uses for cerium is high on the agenda in some of the materials research labs around the country. Interestingly, if we are able to invent a replacement for neodymium, then we reduce the value of neodymium, that can reduce the economic sustainability of our mines. That would actually in turn make it more difficult to obtain europium and terbium, which are desperately needed for the consoles on your smartphone. So you have to be careful. When you win on one project, sometimes that causes a loss on other um, aspects of the use of these materials because they are all so intimately linked together. Finally, let me talk about future directions for rare earths and sustainable technologies. We hope that um, we will be able to diversify sources. We'll be able to make mining cleaner, more efficient, more economical, so that more mines can be developed, so that there are mines in different parts of the world and we're not reliant upon a single source. Anytime we're reliant upon a single source, that is generally speaking an unsustainable supply chain because it's vulnerable to um, political upheaval, it's vulnerable to natural disaster that might occur in the one place where the one mine exists. Um, and so having sources in different parts of the world is very important making the mines more economically sustainable by f finding uses for underutilized rare earths like cerium for example is also an important prospect if you can come up with a use for lanthanum or for cerium that will cause its price to go up then you can make the price for neodymium and terbium and europium and all the others actually go down so this interlinking is very important and understanding the economics that underlies the technology is vital. We're working very hard, to, as I said, to invent substitutes. High strength magnets with uh, less neodymium and dysprosium or no neodymium or dysprosium is very important. Working on phosphors for lighting that lack yttrium, europium or terbium is very highly challenging indeed, but it's something that we're beginning to make some headway in. And finally, reducing waste, improving uh, the buy to ship ratio in manufacturing, that is reducing the amount of material that a manufacturer has to buy in order to ship a million pairs of um, earbuds for your iPhones, uh, that will reduce the demand for the rare earths and improving the recycling, both in process, that is using up the waste material that's generated during manufacturing, and improving recycling at the end of life. So when you finished using your earbuds, when they finally wear out, 
or um, when you lose them because they're so tiny, somebody should pick them up and instead of just throwing them away, they should go somewhere where they can be recycled. But recycling, as I said, is a very big challenge. I hope you get some idea of some of the complexity of dealing with the question of sustainability. You recognize that sustainability is not only a question of the environment, but is also a question of economics, uh, material as well. Materials have to be sustained so we don't run out of them. Um, and that it's a very complex and interlinked process. I hope I've given you something to think about next time you put the earbuds back in your ears.